Okay. Um, so I guess that means I'm supposed to invite my panel up. Yay, my panel. Come on, Janet. Come on, Michael. Come on, Christian. Come on, Jessica. And let me just say, I am not going to introduce them because ARC has gone to the incredible trouble of putting a phenomenal biographical package together. And because they gave me the very small task of addressing the very narrow topic of race, gender, identity, and technology in the 21st century, I am not going to take our time to introduce them. Um, but I will say you should read their biographies because they're each incredibly impressive people who've done an incredible body of work. Oh, and we get to sit. Good, I get to sit. All right, there is room for me. So let me just say a couple of things um, to set this panel up. Um, you know, I, I was gonna, I, I was trying to figure out how to start today because this is such a big, broad, important topic, um, but it also covers a tremendous amount of territory. And you know, I was, usually I start by saying I am an angry black woman, um, and that usually is true. Um, and, and, and I thought somehow in this crowd that wasn't really much of a statement. <laughs> <laughs> when you say it in front of the Democratic caucus, it's a very big statement of the U.S. House, but um, this is not quite that impact. And then I thought, you know, I'd, I'd, I would tell, uh, you know, Rinku was telling us yesterday in our race communications workshop the importance of narrative, and I thought, you know, that's so true. Um, and I get so much of my own inspiration from my own children. I'm a mother of two daughters. Um, and I thought, I, and they are the children of me, obviously. <laughs> It's true. Uh, and of my partner, um, who is Jewish. And so, you know, I, I've had two experiences with both my kids as girls growing up, you know, in this very complex society with this, these very complex of identities that they're trying to form. And so my, my story about my eight-year-old was that, you know, the census form came, the 2010 census form came. And um, I had Harlan, we're doing the good gender stuff, trying to you know, break down the gender roles. So Harlan was making dinner, my partner. My mother has Alzheimer's um, at the time. Um, not the most cognitively intact person, and she was still living with us at the time. Um, but, but a wonderful, committed activist in her own right, and a white woman. Uh, and, and my two kids, and I, I come home and they're all, you know, the girls are setting the table, my mother's sitting there, census form is on the table, Harlan's, you know, setting the table, and I pick up the census form, and being an angry black woman, I start lecturing my family. <laughs> And I start lecturing them on the critical importance of political blackness, right? And I start saying, and you know, and I do this whole, I won't even go through the speech with you because we only have uh, over an hour. And I, like, I'm, I'm lecturing them and I'm pontificating and I'm on my soapbox and the soapbox is getting higher and higher. And, um, and then I say, so political blackness, who's with me? And my white Alzheimer's having mother's hand shoots up immediately and goes, me! You know, and Harlan, knowing better, immediately shoots his hand up and says, me, I'm, I'm there, I'm with you. And Naja, who, you know, is also the brown child, was like, oh yeah, I'm black. And Kai, my eight-year-old, who is my mother's child, not really mine, looks exactly like my mother, very, very, very fair-skinned, let me say. Uh, and she is looking at all of us like we are insane. And she says, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm white. <laughs> and, <laughs> True story. Um, and I'm like, okay, and you know, me being the mother that I am, the racial justice advocate, I'm saying, okay, she's eight, I just, she was six at the time, I, was, I just didn't explain this right, right? <laughs> My vocabulary was a little too large. You know, I said things like structural racialization. So I said, you know, okay, baby, well, here's what I really mean. Who, who, who gave, who, where did you come from? And she went, you. And I said, right, and what am I? And she went, black. And I said, right, so what are you? And she went, white. <laughs> So, you know, the complexity of race and gender in American society. Um, and so, on our 2010 census form, it says we are a family of three black adults, one white child, and one black child. So, I'm, I'm convinced that child welfare is going to be showing up by our door to figure out, like, whose little white child we stole. Um, so. 
Uh, and then, and then the, the only other story, which is for my 11-year-old, who, who, who actually looks Pakistani, right? And, we, you know, she, they, both my kids go to our inner city public school, which is 95, highly diverse, but 95% not white. And um, my 11-year-old, she's now 11 at the time, of course, she was in elementary school, and um, she is trying to struggle with her identity as black, which she very much owns, and as Jewish, right? And she has been Jewish since she was three years old. I mean, she just decided that she was Jewish. And we're not a religious family, so I don't know where this came from, but it certainly was not from her father, who thinks he's Buddhist. Um, but she, she, you know, she, she, she went to this process of, of telling, every, and so she had a little child's Bible, and she was reading the Old Testament, and you know, saying she couldn't wait to read about my religion when that Jesus guy came. And, and so she was this brown, child going to her inner city public school telling everybody she was a Hebrew. I mean, and I mean Hebrew, not Jewish, because that's how it says in the Bible, she was a Hebrew, which really confused her classmates really a lot. And then they had, because most of them are immigrant kids, right? I mean, the West Indies and Latin America and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Tibet. I mean, it's a really, really diverse classroom. And they, they have to do this project of country of origin. Mm -hmm. And, and it was like, I mean, it was a wonderful thing that there's not an assumption that country of origin is the United States, and right? And that's, that in and of itself really marked the school's understanding of its population. But for my daughter, so she comes home with the school project and she's like, mommy, mommy, where are we from? And I was like, oh hell if I know. I mean, <laughs> shit. Like, I mean, it's called slavery, baby. It's somewhere, oh, I don't know. <laughs> East, Eastern shore of Maryland plantation, does that count? You know, and she was like, which is true by the way, I'm, I'm back home, so, okay. So she, she says, so she's like, that won't work. Um, cause she needs a country of origin and the US, she refuses to put the US cause that's not interesting. So she finally goes to her father who starts saying, well, you know, you're on my father's side, there was this, they were from this town, but sometimes it was in Poland and sometimes it was in Russia, right? And she was like, okay, that's not going to work. And so she settled, but his mother's side, there were, were German Jews and, and Holocaust survivors. And so, so, so she settles on Germany. <laughs> so, she, so, so she shows up in her all not white immigrant classroom huh. with her brown ass self, That's great. her black Hebrew brown ass self saying she's from Germany. <laughs> so I think that says it all about our panel and what we're going to discuss today. <laughs> So with that, and I'm, I'm going to sit and hope the mic works so I can join these wonderful people. So, Michael. Yes. Michael. So race, how do, how, so if, if race is not a biological phenomenon, if it's socially constructed, how do we construct it and what does it mean that we construct it? I think you already answered the question, Maya, <laughs> in many respects. And I think that just, you know, your narrative about what was going on within your own family really speaks to this part about how race is socially constructed in a number of ways. One thing, when you talk about the census, for example, is the clash oftentimes between state-based definitions about race and ethnicity and how individuals or groups see themselves. And this has been a continuing kind of dilemma for the Census Bureau. Last summer I spent about four days at the Census Bureau uh, it's really mind-boggling to hear about, for, for example, um, over the last four decades, since the 1980 census, about 40% of Latinos have difficulty figuring out how to uh, answer the census because they're supposed to answer an ethnicity question. In other words, is one Hispanic or not? And a race question. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's claimed that like 94% of people who fill out some other race are actually Latino. By the way, the real funny thing is that uh, outside of Latino, the second most popular term for some, that people wrote in for some of the race was Jedi. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> who I'm sure are thrilled that Star Wars may be back and running again under uh, Disney's hands. Um, 
The other thing is that people don't see themselves represented in the census. There's been various movements since the 1990s to put a Middle Eastern category on. And in fact, the Iranians had a write-in campaign in the 2010 census to write under some of the race, to not mark everything else, put some of the race and put uh, Iranian on there. So there's the thing. There's these big gaps and discrepancies between uh, these prevailing definitions and how people want to see themselves, how they want to organize on that basis. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of it that's really interesting is going forward is that really there's a continuing instability of the concept of race itself. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't been um, dealt with either through these state classifications. Christian could probably speak much more to the fact that we've had a kind of re of race, if mm -hmm. you will, in the wake of the Human Genome Project, where there's a tremendous interest in, say, uh, ethnic ancestry testing, which Skip Gates and Oprah Winfrey right. have uh, sort of popularized in many ways, as well as developments in fields like pharmacogenomics uh, talking about whether or not we can have uh, racially tailored drugs uh, to meet certain mm -hmm. kinds of conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I think leads to instability is that these pan-ethnic labels, which we so glibly refer to as Asian or Latino or black, are really pretty heterogeneous. And going forward, those kinds of differences within those groups, the subgroups which make up those categories, are probably um, the differences are probably going to deepen mm -hmm. in interesting ways. And we should be attentive to that with respect to cultural representations as well as like how people politically mobilize. But let's say something about, okay, so last night we had Juno Diaz who was off the chain, right? <laughs> he was off the chain. Um, you know, really um, mind-blowing. But one of, one of the many, many mind-blowing things he said is say white, right? And I'm so, say white. So, and when we talk about race, we often, in our discussions as a country, assume we're talking about people of color as if white people don't have a social construction around, around their race, right? And whiteness itself is a very complex conversation. So just say a little bit then about the socialization of whiteness, because I don't think we talk enough about that. Well, it's interesting because it's white just becomes the kind of invisible norm in many respects. Mm -hmm. And think about just because of the legacy of, uh, of policies, 1790, who could become a naturalized citizen of the United States? It took us until 1952, 160 years later, to say that race was not going to be the basis upon which a person was denied the right to become a naturalized citizen. This means that when people made claims around uh, recognition, argued for naturalization rights, they always had to claim to some degree whiteness. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and, and that sort of sets the tone for how, in, in many respects, people of color have had to respond to this kind of um, real legacy of white supremacy. Yeah. All right, Janet, I, I want to come to you because one of the things that Juno Diaz said last night that I thought was so powerful is that we have to navigate, we have to get ourselves out of the self-hate maze. And that in getting ourselves out of the self-hate maze, we have to draw a new map to ourselves. Um, and you're someone who, through your own leadership, have written so much about living history, about you know, the importance of our communities, um, as you've said, archiving our lives um, and, and, and living our histories. And you've also talked um, about the narrative as a transgender community, the narrative of the transgender community being trapped in the wrong body and what a negative narrative that is. And can you, so can you just speak a little bit to that? Yeah, um, well, I'm so humbled to be here right now, um, sharing this space with all of you. Uh, Mike, can you oh. maybe hold it up oh, to, oh, no, yeah. Sorry. Oh, is it working? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh. well, I'm humbled to be here. Is that better? Much. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. I think one of the things, you know, just personally having told my story and mm -hmm. kind of this quote unquote coming out, um, I feel as if there's been a lot of attention on me and focus on me as a personality. And um, it's hard when I'm doing that because I'm also talking about my story in the context of all of these things that are going on and that plagues my community, specifically trans women of color, who are overlooked in many of the different intersections. And I also think about our history, when I say living history, I think about how there's like this violent erasure of um, trans women of color being active agents in our own survival and active agents in fighting police brutality from the very mm -hmm. beginning at Stonewall, mm -hmm. at um, 
in Compton and all of these things. There's just kind of like this, yeah, there's these big drag queens who have been out there and these trans women who've been out there, but no one wants to talk about them actually being involved because no one feels like they represent them. Yeah. And um, and you're talking about self-hatred, I think there's a part of that because I think what gender, transgender people tend to do is make us shake up our idea of how we see gender. Mm -hmm. um, and even me as a trans woman, it's, it's difficult in the sense that I'm the right kind of trans woman. I'm passable, I'm quote unquote attractive in terms of how, what we see as desirable. Mm -hmm. I can speak, um, people assume I haven't done sex work, people assume mm -hmm. all these things based on the way that I look and you know my education and all this stuff. But um, I think that I'm really involved in pushing other women to tell their stories as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, I try to create those spaces online and I think that New media is a safe space for trans people in this very, you know, transphobic and misogynistic world to share their stories and to connect with one another and to h maybe hide behind an avatar and be out at least online. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I kind of am all about that right now mm -hmm. because it's empowering to have a woman write to me and say that um, because I told my story, it made her want to tell hers more. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you know telling our stories is revolutionary and it's revolutionary because you know it's dangerous and it causes you know really bizarre kind of um hostility but at the same time it also creates community because you make yourself vulnerable enough for people to see you and in seeing you they see other people see themselves I do want to come back a little later to the role that technology plays in our socializing race and gender, but you know, one of the things I think doesn't get talked about enough, there's so much violence against women of color generally, right? Mm -hmm. And we know 35% of black women experience violence without regard to you know, what category they're placed in. Very, very high, so I think it was 47% of Cambodian women surveyed reported violence of some kind, whether rape, assault. And you know, transgender community, particularly in transgender women of color, that's almost invisible in a lot of even discussion and survey of how violence happens, who perpetrates it. Can you speak a little bit to that? Of course, and it, there's no conversation of having, talking about trans women of color without talking about the fact that there's lack of resources and where they live. And then in addition to that, what kind of, how are they making money? Right. And they're making money through sex work. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a recent survey in urban areas of trans women, more than 59% of them have engaged in sex, survival sex work. And not only do we not care about women of color or women period, but we also don't care about sex workers because our, mor you know, our morality says, mm -hmm. oh, that's bad that they're doing this. But how else are they supposed to pay for these transitional costs mm -hmm. and also not having a home or having even access to health care or um, you know to even get a job mm -hmm. and so in order it's yeah and so I feel like there's no way to talk about violence against trans women without talking about sex work as mm -hmm. this part of it and then also just talking about misogyny mm -hmm. period and how trans women especially those who can't blend in as well as I can are harassed every single day on the street mm -hmm. and are called trannies and are mm -hmm. called all of these horrific things that you wouldn't, and even when I walk into a space, I think about just for myself, sorry, this microphone is just all kinds of, um, even when I walk into a space, you know, people, I know that by being out and people knowing that I'm trans, my body is being dissected. And all of these different things like, oh, well, where, where does she look kind of male? And, you know, and these are things that people are, look at every mm -hmm. single day at, at trans people and trans women of color specifically. And I feel like not only do we gender police ourselves, but people are always policing our bodies as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Christian, I want to come back to you because, you know, this, this notion of, okay, so if race is not a biological construct, if it's just a social construct, why are we, how, I mean, let's talk a little bit more about how, Michael touched on it, how are we biologizing it now, and what's the impact of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, can you hear me? Is that better? Okay. Um, it's <laughs> just like this. Yeah. All right. Um, it's an extremely troubling trend right now, a very ominous trend in terms of reinterpreting race as a discrete biological and genetic entity. Uh, and Michael has written quite a bit about racial construction. And we've accepted it as a truth. We have, science has accepted it as a truth as it is that race is unstable. It is subject to change based on various political contests, right? 
Um, and so the why is a very important question, I think. And I think to answer it, we have to think about the inherent tension between existing racial disparities, existing racial inequality, and inequalities that are actually growing today, uh, and our professed democratic belief in equality. Right? And so there's been a number of ways that we've tried to navigate or resolve, or America, a society has tried to resolve that tension. One, way back in the day, was to construct race in the first place, right? To view it as this biological entity, and therefore, oh. and therefore any existing racial inequalities were viewed to be, that's worse? <laughs> Okay. okay. Now it's on. Woo! Oh, okay, there you go. And therefore, any <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and then, therefore, any existing racial inequalities uh, were viewed to be the natural results of biology, right? Uh, and we've had many other attempts to resolve that moral contradiction, to resolve that cognitive dissonance that society, white America, uh, creates that they don't want to confront white privilege, right? Mm -hmm. And so, biology was one way. Uh, cultural poverty theories was another way that was prominent um, uh, mm -hmm. back in the 70s and for, under President Reagan and so forth and how we've reformed welfare to view existing racial disparities as not the result of continuing racial discrimination or the result of a legacy of racism but rather due to deficient cultural choices. So we've had a lot of distancing moves over the past and I see this the new attempt to conceive of race in genetic terms and biologic terms as just an additional attempt to resolve this inherent moral contradiction between our belief in equality on the one hand and continuing exacerbating racial disparities on the other hand, it takes folks off the hook, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it allows society to not confront privilege. Mm -hmm. So can you say a little bit more as well about DNA testing? Because we've, I mean, we've, we've been talking about the criminal justice statistics, you know, one in three black men between 20 and 29 alone are in the criminal justice system in some form. Mm -hmm. um, what's the role of DNA testing in that? Absolutely, it, it's uh, very troubling. So the way this new view of race as being genetic has, has come about in a, a number of different ways. One is race-based race -based drugs, pharma gen uh, genomics, um, another uh, stems into DNA ancestry testing, but I think one of the most troubling uh, ways this has manifested is in the use of DNA evidence against black and Latino men in the criminal justice system. Um, and there's two ways this comes about. One is genetic surveilling and creating extensive databases of DNA samples collected from uh, persons that are arrested, collected from persons that are convicted of crimes, uh, even misdemeanors. California passed a contested mm -hmm. statute that would allow uh, police to collect a DNA swab from you if you're merely stopped by a police officer. Yeah. So it's completely up to the individual police officer's discretion. That's only uh, been a state-by-state -state approach yet, but I see the, the dark clouds on the horizon. Um, the other way it's come about is in the actual conviction of black and Latino men uh, in court of criminal, uh, of misdemeanors and of felonies and so forth, uh, the introduction of DNA estimates of who the likely perpetrator was. And so it's extremely commonplace right now for an expert for the prosecution to get on the stand and testify, uh, well, the, there's only a one in 10 billion chance that another Hispanic person shares this same DNA profile. There's only a one in 30 million chance that another West Indian person shares this uh, genetic profile, that another African American person, Caucasian person, Asian American person, so on and so forth. Um, and I find this extremely troubling and a reinscription of race as a biological category. Woo, okay, angry black woman. Um, so, now that I'm getting angrier, um, Jessica, you know, and I have to give a shout out to the National Latino Institute, Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, because CSI and the Institute shared office space for three years in two different offices, actually. So it's a little bit of like a, okay, family. Um, but uh, so Jessica, you know, one of the things that Juno Diaz said last night is that we have to rehumanize women. Uh, and I thought it was such an important statement. We didn't get to talk about that enough. And you've talked a lot, obviously, about also 
you know, this kind of how we stigmatize, particularly young women of color, but women of color generally. So can you s say a little bit more about what you think uh, that means yeah. for us? And, and just to add a complexity to your um, census question, I was talking to my Puerto Rican grandma uh, about the census randomly, actually just last week, and she says, you know, uh, race is determined by your hair texture. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like what are you talking about? <laughs> but in Puerto Rico, if right. anyone, you know, I think Latino identity and, and racial construction is very complicated because it comes down to things like that, that your hair texture determines your race. So, different conversation, but uh, yes. So you're white. Uh, no. <laughs> doesn't matter, my, my, mom's, my grandma's from Puerto Rico, my, my father's from Paraguay, South America. doesn't matter, I'm white. Um, but anyway, so yes, we, we saw misogyny on steroids this election season. Oh my goodness. We saw racism mm -hmm. on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we saw the continued dehumanization of women happening um, you know, for years. And we saw this really at a height in this election, the way um, politicians and the media were treating and talking about women. Um, and as a Latina working in the reproductive health rights and justice community, I have to acknowledge sort of the ugly history that women of color have with reproductive technologies, uh, reproductive oppression. Um, in the 18 and 1900s, women of color were particularly targeted um, in terms of their fertility around um, the new technologies that were emerging. So in an effort to um, decrease overpopulation in this country, um, and in Puerto Rico, we found that um, women of color under the eugenics movement that were seen as socially inferior, um, and including women with disability, women in the criminal justice system, um, they were forcibly sterilized, uh, coerced to be sterilized, were treated as guinea pigs um, under uh, the development of contraception and contraceptive methods. Um, so we have a really ugly history of being dehumanized, even in the process of looking at reproductive technologies. Um, so I think, you know, over the past, uh, you know, decade, and, and we've been seeing um, just a resurgence of this, of this anger against women. And um, the policies that were introduced in this past uh, congressional period were Horrific. They were defunding women's health programs that provided basic health care, breast care, um, breast services, and, and pap smears, and, and these basic services that kept women alive in the name of um, uh, defunding abortion, right? So it's become a very politicized issue. And, um, we Except that our bodies can shut that rape yeah, thing oh, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We heard all sorts so. of myths there. And, and just to say, mm. the, the, the uh, politician that mentioned that, um, you know, in, in rape, mm -hmm. that we could shut our bodies down and thus not have uh, get pregnant, um, he was on the science uh, committee. Yeah. He was on the committee on science in the house. So this is this is the kind of rhetoric we're hearing mm -hmm. that's targeting women. That's targeting women of color, mm -hmm. right? And you think about the comments around the 47 percent, um, and how that's really loaded around um, racism, uh, sexism, classism, mm -hmm. uh, xenophobia. I mean, there's just so much loaded in what we're seeing in in this uh, contemporary um, dialogue around uh, women and. and um, women's health. So yes, we absolutely need to rehumanize the women. Um, and women and men are lifting their voices. Mm -hmm. We are uh, angry. Uh, we showed up, and particularly in this election. Uh, we won. Uh, we, we showed up for Obama. And um, we shut down a lot of those uh, politicians and uh, it, efforts that were being um, held throughout the country and in the states that would further dehumanize women and further create barriers to access critical health mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. So that's a step, mm -hmm. but I think we just um, need to continue the fight and we need to continue to monitor and call out this um, racist, sexist, mm -hmm. uh, homophobic, mm -hmm. uh, xenophobic rhetoric that's happening um, to ensure that there's progressive alliances and ensure that our issues are being brought to the forefront mm -hmm. instead of um, pushed down. I have a really unfair question for you. Um, so, you know, we've, the debate about this election, you know, after the returns came in was about the gender gap, mm -hmm. right? So, oh, so many women supported Obama, but of course within that gender, compared to, to men uh, particularly, but when we're saying that we're erasing women of color and erasing white women, because the truth is 56% of white women 
voters voted for Romney. Mm -hmm. So the gender gap is a, a race gender gap. Yeah. It's not a gender gap. 96% yeah. uh, of black women voted for Obama and something like 70, 70, 76. 76% 70, of Latinos voted mm -hmm. for Obama. So there's a race gender gap. There's yeah. not a gender gap. Exactly. Um, but we're, so why, we're saying white, hashtag say white. Um, so this is my unfair question. Um, so given Aiken, given the, this incredibly idiotic rhetoric around women in general, 56% white women, really? Yeah, no. Supporting, and Romney was going to shut down Planned Parenthood, y'all? Or for federal funding for sure? I mean, why are women, and Michael, you could probably address this as well, but why are white women supporting leaders who are antithetical to their interests? That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it really, it, it stumps me. I told you it was they, unfair. Yeah, it, it just really, it actually really stumps me yeah. as how many women, white women did turn out and vote mm -hmm. for, for Romney. Um, but again, I think it's just really important to highlight the impact that women of color had on this yes. election. Right. And that, and those high rates that you mentioned and, and the impact that they had. Um, and the alliances that we saw right. um, across communities of color, across other progressive communities. Um, and I think we need to really focus on that because we're the future of this country, right? right? Um, every month, 50,000 young Latino citizens turn 18, mm -hmm. right? So that's 50,000 new Latino voters. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to ensure that they're getting registered, they're needing, they, they need to turn out. Um, and make their voices heard so that we're, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. stomping out those, those uh, questionable voters mm -hmm. <laughs> um, who supported a, a politician that just was hostile, mm -hmm. hostile to women. Yeah. Well, it just, it, it, for me, what it lifts up is the way in which racialized identity mm -hmm. can trump gender identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what that represented yeah, to me. But, very complicated, yeah, identity. But I, I want to turn to the role of technology, particularly with this, uh, Juno Diaz call it this, this, this glimpse into the new possibility and, and to new coalitional opportunity, but it does require us to cross a lot of psychological and socialized constructions of difference, right? And, uh, but I w I'm going to share, a li and I want to talk about the role of technology in that, both as a barrier in some of the ways we've talked, but also as an opportunity. Um, but one of the things I wanted to just lift up, so I was, I was tweeting Juno Diaz last night, and one of the things I tweeted, remember he talked about the growing market share of whiteness? Um, and in that he was talking about the proliferation of like skin bleaching mm -hmm. products, right? And so I'm tweeting this, you know, using technology and this new social media, and as a result of my tweeting, I have a new follower, uh, Dr. Wilford Brown, certified plastic surgeon specializing in aesthetic surg surgical procedures and non-surgical procedures from Middlebury, Connecticut. Somehow that seemed really wrong to me. That, like that was the follower that I got as a result of those tweets. But can you all speak to, and I'm going to open up to all of you, the role of technology in this social construction of race and gender, what are the opportunities there to change it, to make it more positive and proactive for this glimpse of a new coalitional majority that we can be? And what are some of the things that we're seeing in terms of how technology is being used against that? I, I have a very quick response to that. You know, we, we think about race and understand race as being a social construction, and it certainly is. Um, but science is also social construction, mm -hmm. all right? It's, oh, also, wow. it, it, it's also a mediated field of knowledge. And so I think there are a number of opportunities for pushback for, for projects, for racial, positive racial projects to, to change um, how scientists and how society as a whole interprets and uses science. Because I'm not against genetics as a right. whole, right? I mean, genetics has a lot of promise. Uh, but racialized genetics uh, is extremely disturbing uh, for a number of reasons that right. I've mentioned. Right. Michael, come yeah, on I'm now, give us the positive. Yeah, <laughs> boy, give us the positive. Huh? You know, this thing about prediction is really difficult. I was thinking about this. There was this quote by uh, Lao Tzu once said, uh, those who have knowledge don't predict, and those who predict don't have knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways, that's probably the slippery slope around technology, too. So what, what, what's the positive aspects of that? Well, one of the positive aspects we could have about that is to really rethink um, in, 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 in using various forms of social media, uh, some of the kinds of artificial boundaries we've drawn between groups. 
and the ways in which those can be broached in some fashion. And we're seeing the glimmers of this already. As you were talking about in the recent election, we had like uh, at least seven, sorry, can you hear me now? I'll talk louder, is that good? Oh, that, yeah. We, yeah. They want you to take the mic. Oh, they want me to take the mic. Yeah. Okay. Power, we had, we power had, to the audience. We had at least 71% of the Latino voters for Obama. We had 74% of Asians, which is quite striking, as well as the uh, sort of the numbers in the 90s for the African American groups. Um, what's very interesting is around this changing demography is how people are going to respond to these kinds of shifts and address them, because the potential lies there for. Uh, cross-racial alliances. At the same time, there's some interesting other currents. You were talking about how, in fact, uh, whether or not race trump gender with respect to this divide. And certainly, gender and race are really complexly connected. Race is gendered and gender is raced. And to a large extent, what we may be witnessing, too, is the collapse of this white majority. And that presents itself as a, a moment of crisis. I think there's a lot of white working class men who feel they're the new marginalized group, right. that they're the folks that have been disenfranchised by these changes. Mm -hmm. And the backlash to that is to other, other folks. Think about the birther movement, mm -hmm. the ways John Sununu wishes that Obama would learn to become an American. Mm -hmm. uh, these are ways in which um, what's disturbing is whether or not that seeps into the popular culture as well and the kind of resentment that that can breed. Yeah, that's important. Janet, can you say, I mean, because I, I think the point you made earlier is so important about the way in which the transgender community, particularly transgender women of color, really challenge some of these social constructions around race and gender. So can you say a little bit about how you see the technology helping to transform that? Sorry. Is that, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Um, I think for me, what, the most powerful thing that um, social media provides for me is that I don't need to rely on mainstream media to say that I'm valuable mm -hmm. and that my image matters. Um, and by me saying that it does matter by broadcasting my life, mm -hmm. I let other young trans women of color know that they're represented mm -hmm. and that they're represented well. When I show a picture of me speaking in front of mm -hmm. an audience of people, they say that, oh, it is, it's a safer world out there or that mm -hmm. that's a potential that I can be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's powerful to say that, um, to self, not only self-determine who you are, which is what mm -hmm. I consider what I did, mm -hmm. like I was raised this little boy and told mm -hmm. you were a boy. Mm -hmm. And me saying, well, I'm closer to kind of this, not so much, I didn't know that I was a girl. I didn't mm -hmm. really know what it was that I was. Mm -hmm. I know it was closer to representing who I was with my, my transitioning. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people are just like, well, you're sick. And as you said, science is, is constructed. Mm -hmm. But in, you know, according to medicine, I'm sick. Mm -hmm. I have an illness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where trapped in the wrong body get, really irks me. Mm -hmm. I know that some people do feel that, so I validate them. Mm -hmm. But for me, I didn't necessarily feel trapped. I felt there were some things I couldn't stand. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I'm always about reproductive justice as well, because it's we should have the right to do what we want to our bodies. Um, and so that's where I feel trans women intersect with women in general, period. Because we go underground to get all of these things, you know, to get our medicine, to get um, access to get our medicine. And um, I think about how that's what they want to do by taking away abortion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they right. want women to go underground and right. be unsafe. Right. And we've been unsafe for a really long time. And I always talk about how amongst trans women, there's this underground railroad of resources. You go to this doctor in Thailand and you do this there. Mm -hmm. You go to Tijuana to get your ass pumped. You do this and this, mm -hmm. you know, and these are, these are systems that we've created for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, now that we have on you know, this social media, we can share resources so much easier and get safer resources, even though they still are underground and not um, validated. But the most powerful thing for me is just being able to broadcast my life and have that reflection coming back and forth. Have you seen any reflection back too that for people who are not tra from the transgender yes. community who women are being of color? Yeah, period. so can you say a little bit Mostly about black that? women. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah. seeing them embrace me in this way of, and I, maybe that's why I told my story Marie Claire. I did mm -hmm. use the mass media mm -hmm. in order to get my mm -hmm. story out there. And it was women of color that surprised me. I had no idea that they would embrace me as their sister. And that mm -hmm. is just, that's one of the most powerful mm -hmm. things. 
Um, black men, it's a whole nother thing. I won't even go there. <laughs> because to, to them, I'm a threat. I'm trying to infiltrate their penises. Like, I want to attack their penises or something. I was like, I have a boyfriend. I've had a boyfriend for four years. And before that, no men were complaining about having sex with me. Uh -huh. So it's not like I was trying to... I'm trying to... Um, attack you in some way, but there's like this hostility with black men. Mm -hmm. It's just, I can't really, mm -hmm. I just let that go. But black women have been so mm -hmm. embracing and mm -hmm. nurturing and affirming of me. And I think mm -hmm. that online, I'm probably the, I'm one of the only trans people that people know, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm in their Twitter feeds, I'm in their Facebook feeds, I'm in all of these things. And so I become visible in these mm -hmm. spaces where where, I never, where people would never probably have interface yeah. with me. And I want to really appreciate you for that, because I think the hashtag girls like us has mm -hmm. been really, I mean, for me, it was a huge educational opportunity, and I really appreciated it. Well, thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Um, Jessica. Yeah. So I actually want to um, go back to your last question. Mm -hmm. the That's unfair, fine. The unfair yeah. question. The unfair and question. Though, uh, although the census would consider me white, I don't consider myself white, so mm -hmm. I, I can't speak for white women, mm -hmm. but I, I do wonder how much class had an impact on the Romney vote. I really wonder mm -hmm. that because, um, you know, I think there was really a class distinction that were very, very clear in this election and his appeal to those of higher class mm -hmm. and higher wealth. Um, so I wonder maybe perhaps that's a you know, factor. An, this is really, I mean, because if we really were going to be expansive on this panel, it would mm -hmm. be the race, gender, class, right? Yeah. Because they're also, you know, Ira Katz Nelson talks about it as the Gordian knot. You know, they're really not separable yeah. um, in terms of how we've constructed identity. But, it, you know, it's interesting what you're saying because NPR did a piece um, where they went to, there was some motorcycle convention in Florida. Like, you know, so all these, you know, big white guys with tattoos on hogs. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of them, most of them were Republicans and most of them were low income. Um, and so the interviewer was sort of asking about it and this, this point was, uh, the, the <laughs> The game. You know, I can't see that. So I just know you're telling me to shut up, but I can't actually see the, I can't see the, t huh? What, yes, thank you. Um, so, ju but just the point was that they were all saying, um, a, 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 a person on welfare never gave me a job, right? So that was the kind of construction for them. So that even though they were that 47% that Romney was talking about, he also represented for them the guy that gave them a job, which I thought was like kind of staggering mm -hmm. and depressing, but okay. <laughs> but um, what we're gonna do, I really wanted to make sure, Gary, I stole this from Gary Delgado. So Gary, if you're here, I did, I'm totally stealing this from you. Um, to make it a little bit, this is a lot of really rich, but also complex information. And you all have a lot to say about it yourselves and also a lot you probably wanna interrogate around this. So we're gonna give you 10 minutes to talk at your tables with each other about anything you're hearing that you want to talk about. Um, but also, uh, volunteers and ARC staff are going to be circulating. So I, we really also want to hear your questions or comments. So if you have one, um, grab the person in the gray t-shirt or red t-shirt that's circulating to hand them up a question. They'll hand it to me so that we can also kind of hear from you in, in the questions towards the end. So we're going to give you 10 minutes. Yeah. Offer something before yes, we absolutely. So um, the way that we approach our work is through a reproductive justice lens. I can, think can folks yeah, okay. the way we approach our work is through a reproductive justice lens, and it speaks to what we just what we just talked about that you can't separate uh, gender, uh, gender identity, gender formation, sexual orientation, uh, economic status, immigration status. Uh, you know, all these things are inextricably linked. So when we look at advancing policies that promote women's health, we're thinking about all those things. Um, are trans women getting cervical cancer screenings? Right, uh, trans, sorry, trans men, are they getting cervical cancer screenings? This is something really critical to think about that we have to look at how all these factors are weaved into a framework that is inclusive and advances uh, a comprehensive vision of our future. Thank you. And when we come back, it's gonna be around opportunities to change all this, but talk amongst yourselves. Okay. All right. <laughs> I do have a question that is directed to our male panelists explicitly. <laughs> so Juno Diaz talked about needing to acknowledge whiteness to address privilege and power. Can either of the male-identified panelists talk about gender? Men, <laughs> men folk. <laughs> well, 
biological. Um, as you noted, and that is biological. We got some yeah. biology there. <laughs> yeah, as you noted, as we talk about race, and most of my focus is on race, but race is gender, race is class, race is many things, and so is class, and so is gender. Um, so I do think it's extremely important to acknowledge that as we construct and protest and contest science itself, uh, that there may be many fields of contestation, including the, my work on race and racial inequality is just not about race, mm -hmm. I suppose I should say. It's about class, it's about gender, uh, it's about all identity categories that are currently being contested in our mm -hmm. society. Michael? Yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to sort of, uh, I, I just cited it as well, and Christian did too, this notion about race being gendered and gender being race. I think it's very important to see how this kind of unraveled historically, particularly in the United States. You could think about, for example, some of the earliest anti-miscegenation laws, like the, those in the colonies, are really directed at keeping um, sexual unions between blacks and whites separate, but many of the codes are explicitly written to keep white women in their place. Mm -hmm. So much of the early ones in the Virginia colony, for example, uh, mm -hmm. talk explicitly about, uh, about sexual unions uh, between white women and black men. So there's ways in which these things are connected, but there's also ways in which race and gender have operated um, along parallel tracks, but other times have diverged too. So I'm thinking that we, we really need to be attentive to looking at how these patterns of stratification and difference, how they intersect and how they diverge uh, you know, in, in the course of, of things going on in the US and if not globally. And we really need to take serious question about patriarchy as a particular kind of hierarchy of a particular way in which um, of gender oppression that's expressed itself through institutions, through uh, collective identities, and through the ways people conduct themselves in the most intimate relations. And I think in there we'll, we can sort of begin to fathom the kinds of outlines about the ways in which they complexly connect. Thank you. Uh, this is not a question, but it's really an important one to say, and I really appreciate whoever wrote it. Please let Janet know that there's at least one black man that loves her. <laughs> Your black penis is safe with Janet, y'all. <laughs> okay. right. Don't tweet that. I got kids. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so another important question, do you see whiteness potentially expanding to Latinos or others as for Greeks and Eastern European Jews in the past? And I, that's given the changing demographics of the country, I think that's a critically important question. Jessica, you want to start? I want to note is that in, in Puerto Rico, in the last, in the 2000 census, I think Puerto Rico was <laughs> one of the whitest states or, or communities in the census because, again, when you pose the question in a way, what's your ethnicity? Are you Hispanic, Latino, slash, you know, yes or no? And then what's your race? Or, I don't know, it, yeah, if that's the way it goes. Yeah. So, you know, that really forces Latinos to choose whether we're white, we're black, we're Alaskan Native, or, but there's no, a lot of Latinos are, have indigenous backgrounds, right? We come from, mm -hmm. um, you know, tribal communities in South America and the Caribbean. So, but there's no place for that because it it it, it asks for a registered tribe. Mm -hmm. So many of us don't come from that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a really important question to ask, and I think the census really needs to think about how to be more inclusive of Latino people of indigenous backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Michael. Uh, yeah, I think what's interesting. I think there's a real pronounced trend within a lot of the sociological literature to think about whether Latinos, quote unquote, light-skinned Latinos or Asian Americans are being brought into a kind of expanding notion of whiteness. Mm -hmm. And I think it really speaks to this question of what we think racial hierarchy is going to look like going forward. Uh, in other words, are we going to see the deepening of the white-black divide and the kind of appeals to absorb some of the other groups into some notion of being honorary whites or an expanded notion of whiteness? Or are we really seeing the development of a real, much more 
um, multiracial forms of stratification across the board. And I think that's a, that's a, a key issue. And I think there's a, a sociologist named George Yancey who wrote a book, uh, Who is White, mm -hmm. arguing that, uh, using survey data, that whites and Latinos, um, in terms of their political attitudes, are much more closer to the white side of the racial boundaries than they are to the black side. And I think this, I, I mean, we need to think these issues out because they, sp they speak to very crucial issues around coalition building, around how we think um, race and racism function, and also, uh, you know, to understand too, really the unique historical position of African Americans mm -hmm. with respect to all these debates, and to sort of recenter what what mm -hmm. what that means. You know, I, I really want to kind of lift this up one step further because I, uh, there's another question about the percentage of Latinos who acknowledge their remote or near African ancestry, right? Jessica was speaking to this, um, and mark this on census forms and on government forms, and because obviously the census is one of the kind of systemic mechanisms that racialize us, but there's also this notion, as my intro story said, about the political importance of actually standing up as a particular race, even if our own racial identities are more complex. I was thinking of in South Africa, you know, part of the anti-apartheid struggle was that everyone who wanted to stand up against apartheid insisted that they were black. So South Asians said we're black, uh, you know, and that was their disruption of the racial hierarchy that apartheid created, which started to crumble after uh, apartheid fell, but it, it, you know, it raises this question about how we disrupt, right? So I wanted to throw this back. You all are disrupting in various ways, right? You're disrupting the social construction of race and gender and class and how that Gordian knot comes together. What are the opportunities for that disruption and you know, where are the mechanisms where we, that we should be pulling the levers of disrupt, disruption? Just, just a personal story. In 2004, the, st the census did a test in New York and in Georgia on the race question. And they allowed you to choose a race, more than one race, but it didn't allow you to check off an other. And it was just a test. And they knocked on our door. <laughs> they knocked on our door. And my partner answered the door, who's Peruvian. And, you know, again, are you Latino? Yes, no. What's your race? And there was no other category. So he's like, what can I put? And they're like, well, you choose. It's, you know, how do you identify? So he chose black. Mm -hmm. He chose black and he's of, you know, very sort of Incan roots, mm -hmm. um, but there was no other place that he found himself. And I think that was a disruptor. Um, I'm one of those people that checked other and I wrote Latina. <laughs> I know I, you know, I didn't write Jedi, but I wrote Latina. Um, and I, I did that as a political statement because I know mm -hmm. they think I'm white and mm -hmm. I know I should be checking white as, in terms of how they create those how racial categories, mm -hmm. but I refuse to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, kind of using the writing category as an opportunity um, and if they force a, and I don't know the future, perhaps you all have some feedback on that in terms of how it's going to look in the future. Um, if they limit that other category and try to um, be more specific, you know, what are the ways that we can disrupt it and, and, own, and claim an identity to kind of push back at the census and, and say that this is much more complex than what is being offered? Mm -hmm. Just as a footnote to Jessica's observation, actually the census has been doing a lot of this kind of testing about revising the forms. And it looks like for census 2020, that what we'll see is Latino, Hispanic as a racial category and not in the elimination of the ethni ethnicity question. Oh, interesting. So that could be coming up. Okay. Janet. Anything on, on gender? Do you know if there's... Oh, no, because it's kind of an assumption of... Everyone heard of that? The yeah. Janet's question female, was on gender. It's only male, right? female, right? Yeah, it's only and male, so female, right. For yeah. me, I check, you know, check female and black, even the, you know, though there's the Pacific Islander and all this stuff, I'm representing my mother. Mm -hmm. um, my Sorry. This one? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I check female and black, but, you know, a lot of people need more spaces to check in, in gender mm -hmm. because people express their gender so much differently yeah. and it's just kind of like a mandate from just so many systems telling us that yeah. our gender is only, you know, within this binary. And even yeah. though I, I am very constructed through the binary and that's kind of my identity, I understand mm -hmm. my identity is within that, there's many people, there's a diversity there, and I think we need to learn how to, you know, expand our, our blackness, our, 
our whiteness, our, you know, um, you know, my femaleness, my womanness, mm -hmm. madness, mm -hmm. or genderness, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. And so these forms are just, yeah, I find them very limiting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are the opportunities for this new majority, right? I mean, we're talking about the complexity of, of our own identities. We're talking about how it relates to how we disrupt and make change. Um, and a, a lot of the questions coming up, I think, from the audience, whether it's effective ways for women of color and white women to form permanent alliances, but it's also across you know, this complexity around race, class, and gender that we're, we're also talking about. What are our opportunities for that? What do you see coming up as a, as a way for our, us to construct our future together? Well, I, I think there are some unique opportunities going forward, and it's very hard to predict exactly how it's going to play out. I think how it plays out will mostly depend on how we continue or how society continues to negotiate this notion of whiteness. Right? And we've talked about whiteness a lot, and, and you brought up the Latino voter uh, uh, whiteness aspect, whether or not you know, Latinos are, are, and Latinas are, are necessarily trying to uh, enter the whiteness sphere. Um, but it's not limited only to Latinos and Latinas. Racial passing continues to this day. A lot of folks like to think that the notion of in passing by its very term is, is problematic. Uh, it, it doesn't occur, but it does amongst many groups. And I see this all the time where folks are asserting aspects of their whiteness in order to obtain particular benefits depending on the context. And so I think uh, to the extent we can take advantage of this new majority, however we define it, it depends greatly on how we continue to negotiate whiteness and determine what that means. It's in flux, it's constantly in flux and that presents an opportunity. Yeah, okay, important. Yep. Um, I think what's is that the okay. I think what was exciting to see was something that happened here in Maryland around the alliances between those advocating for the passage of the DREAM Act and those advocating for the passage of mar marriage equality here in Maryland. And I think those kind of alliances is what we're going to see in the future. And I think those are really promising because it, it, it not just looks at race and class, it looks at uh, gender equality, orientation, it looks at immigration status, um, and how those movements are actually inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important example and, and something that I'm really hopeful is going to kind of um, pave the way for the future in terms of alliances between race, class, gender, orientation, immigration status. Immigration status is so interesting because it's, it's been painted in the media as a Latino issue. And while many Latinos are, are immigrants and many immigrants yes. are Latinos, it is not just a Latino mm -hmm. issue. It is not. Yeah. Well, I went to Capitol Hill one day and I found all these folks wearing green shirts and they were Irish undocumented immigrants. Irish undocumented <laughs> immigrants. And that was pretty awesome to yeah. see Irish and say, uh, advocating for passage of the DREAM Act. Yeah. So I think, again, we have to kind of rethink the way we look at immigration, that it really transcends a lot of races. But, you know, there's a lot of political education in that, too. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to go to Belfast, and was, it was really amazing how f uh, for Northern Irish Catholics, right, who really are an oppressed group in Northern Ireland in many ways that we would consider racialized, they have a deep kind of political education around colonialism and very much see themselves as part of an anti-colonial movement that includes Africa and Latin America and Asia, right? And they lift up those leaders. And I, so I, one of the things that I think is so important is these opportunities for political education that happens across all of our difference, right, or, and our constructions that help us understand the structural forces that produces racialization. I just want to give a shout out to South by Southwest, which is SWU and SWAP and Southern Echo that are working very hard on this, California Calls Coalition in California working multiracially. So I think we're, we're seeing pockets of this, um, and some of it's very strategic and very powerful, but getting that to scale uh, is also something I think is really, so that's y'all's job. Okay, Can I say something yeah. just to jump on that? Um, speaking of you know demographics, I think about that um, recent Gallup poll mm -hmm. saying that more people of color, more women, more people who make under twenty-four thousand dollars identify as LGBT. Mm -hmm. But then I also think about some of the essays that I read that were very drenched in white supremacy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were very committed to saying, no, 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 no. We're not as LGBT people. We're not. We're not poor, and we're not black. We're actually 
you know, privileged and, you know, we are, we're a marketable place for you to come to. You know, don't say that because advertisers then won't, you know, sponsor our galas and they won't do all of these things if they know that we're more, you know, of color and, you know, just yeah. completely different than what modern family right. and the new normal and all these places say that the wow. community actually looks like. Mm -hmm. And so I think about those coalitions when they're actually working together mm -hmm. and that's the hope, mm -hmm. hopefully, that they actually address what the LGBT community really looks like. Great. There's another great question from the audience. They've all been fantastic. How do you think the GOP will use more faces of color? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, several names coming up. This won't go through all the names, and, but Bobby Jindal, obviously, being one most prominent this week. To appear on the surface more inclusive in the 2016 election. And what do we do about that? Yeah, I mean, I'll the, add. the call after the election, the first thing I heard about was we need to pass immigration reform. Yeah. Right? Oh. And, and, and again, I think, it, again, it would make the assumption that all immigrants yes. are Latino because the Latino vote was so powerful. Uh, and, and that was shocking to hear because uh, in the last couple of Congresses, we saw them voting down their own bills that they had, pa they had right. uh, introduced in the past. So we have to really question those motives, <laughs> if that's not clear. And, um, and using the faces of people. You mean you don't trust on Hannity? <laughs> We trust Romney or Ryan? No. Um, so I think we have to really kind of, again, question the motives and question how they're really tokenizing these mm -hmm. faces of color. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Rubio in Florida, he was really looked at. And in fact, someone said, oh, well, the mistake that Romney made was not choosing Senator Rubio as a running mate. You know, <laughs> because of that Latino vote. They would have, and again, it's like, first is dumb. It's, it's making dumb the Latino electorate saying, oh, just because there's a Latino face, we're going to vote for this candidate. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think there's just a lot of, it's just very loaded. Yeah. And I think his comments post-election on that you know, conference call where he said that it's the urban community that uh, turned out, it, it's the gifts that- Code, code. The, the code, code. The gifts that were given to those people that want things code, 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 right? Very race. Unlike Romney's <laughs> friends. They didn't want anything. Exactly, exactly. And if you look at how, <laughs> and you look how much money was spent on the elections, I think the exciting thing was that money, we, we didn't see money by the elections this year, which was really exciting. Um, but we, yes, yes. Or it was our money. Yeah. <laughs> but our, we did see. We, it's our $10. Yes. Okay. But we, we, we still, still look at that. It's right. not like we should rest right. assured because Citizens United presents tremendous barriers for the future. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, it's very mm -hmm. problematic. And you're going to see them starting to lift up mm -hmm. their people. I mean, we saw them in the GOP convention, right? Mm -hmm. They had some people were speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, all the mm -hmm. faces of the color to, to demonstrate that diversity. Um, but if you look at the audience, who was in the audience? Right. Right. So right. I, I think. We're going to continue to see that. Others? Comments on this? You know, just a, a quick comment. I think that all of that is a pretty thin veneer. You yeah. know, I think the, the Republican Party is in quite in a crisis about how to sort of expand out without having Louder. to deal with, without having to do substantive-based issues around this. You know, I sort of like the flip of this. If you haven't seen it, what's a great uh, clip on YouTube is uh, Chris Rock, the video from uh, the Jimmy Kimmel program, uh, Message it's to hilarious. White Voters, about how to, how to convince them about Obama as a white Barry candidate. Barry Obama. <laughs> Barry Obama, right. Yeah. Um, Janet, Christian, anything you want to add? No, okay. Uh, so, Christian, actually, this uh, this is actually a really important question, and I'm going to direct it directly to you. But uh, someone in the audience is asking for examples of race-based medicines and drugs, because this is something that is also not. It's happening, it's happening pervasively, but it's also not something that we're all getting the information about. Right, that's absolutely right. Um, so there is a lot of money in pharmaceutics, and there's a lot of money in race-based pharmaceutics, largely because it allows researchers to utilize drugs whose patents have expired or are about to expire and add a racial label to them and now they obtain um, a new patent. Um, and so this is partly the genesis of, of these race-based drugs. One such dr uh, drug is called Bidal, and uh, this drug uh, doesn't exist anymore, but it was um, actually approved by the FDA 
I believe, uh, in the early 2000s uh, to treat hypertension in uh, African Americans. Um, and hypertension clearly is an extremely important health issue and public concern. There are a number of health concerns uh, where there are disparities along race grounds. Mm -hmm. But because there are disparities along race grounds does not necessarily mean we should conceive of race as a genetic stable Well, it's ignoring category. how neighborhoods are constructed in exactly. unhealthy ways or how is racism is stressful. Exactly. I mean, studies have shown right? time and racism time again, racial discrimination, racism is a leading cause of hypertension, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, and, and there's a number of other issues that come into play as well. Um, so that's And if you haven't example. seen Unnatural Causes, <laughs> that really breaks us down. It's a fantastic film from California Newsreel. But anyway, yes, to yeah, your yeah. point. And so, so that's one example of a drug that was targeted specifically on race grounds for the African American mm -hmm. population to treat hypertension. Mm -hmm. uh, again, to, because they're able to get new mm -hmm. patent protection mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. uh, racing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so I want to give, a, we're, we're going to wrap up. I want to just give each of you an opportunity to say the one last burning point that you didn't feel like you got to make, or, you, which I hope you'll do, your, <laughs> your, your, your biggest hope for the potential for this new majority we can build together. You know, I talked a lot about the instability of race, but I think we also need to really think deeply about the instability of racism and what we mean by racism which can it be anywhere from someone giving you a dirty look on the bus to structural forms of inequality. And I say this because I think there, uh, it, we're on the cusp of rethinking some of these issues about how we think about racism. Uh, John Powell, um, who may also be here, has a, a, a great new book out, uh, Racing Justice, in which he's really looking at two literatures, really looking at the structural sort of systemic uh, race, forms of racial inequality that we've generally seen in, in, in many of the social science work. But he's also trying to link that to work that's going on in the cognitive sciences, in the mind sciences, about implicit bias, about the unconscious mechanisms at the level of the, of the individual that operate with certain kinds of schemas that are, are, are race-based and are complexly connected. And usually these two literatures don't speak to each other. And I think it's really engaging to think about how we link up structural forms of inequality with also looking at forms of implicit bias to look at within as well as the kinds of unconscious processes which we use to navigate every day in the world that are founded upon certain kinds of racial decisions. And I think going forward, we need to think about those connections. Thank you. By the way, Christian, if, if they're making a calm your angry black woman drug, I'm pretty sure my family will buy it and slip it into my water. But, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's unfortunately a huge f field. And so there are a number of uh, drugs that are currently undergoing trials and evaluation that aren't yet on the market, but um, it's a very dangerous uh, future, I think. Uh, I, I was just going to leave with a very quick comment, and that is to stay active, stay involved, because if I've learned anything doing my work, it's that battles you thought you've already won can come up yeah. in a brand new form, such as that race is a social construction. Um, I can't believe, I can in some ways, but uh, that we're, we're fighting over this again. Yeah. Um, so thank you all for being so involved and committed to the cause. Uh, that's what we need going forward. Well, all right. Um, let's see. Number one, trans women are women too. So I think that if you're, if you're fighting for women's issues or whatnot, you need to be inclusive of trans women. Um, and I think about that we must, we have to continue um, speaking up and coming out. And you know, a lot of I get a lot of questions from people who say, "Well, you're just a woman. You're not. Why do you say you're trans?" And I say I'm trans because it's revolutionary for me when I walk into a space to say that I'm a trans woman and to be very honest and open about that because then it makes people, it makes it changes people's idea of what this gender thing is and how we've constructed it and built it and then built our own phobias around it. Um, and then just to be open and tell our stories because 
you know, they're not going to, they're not, you know, the mass media is not going to like elevate them. So if we don't talk about them amongst ourselves and then try to infiltrate other spaces on our own, then we're just not going to be counted. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge something our sister in the front shared with us that we didn't acknowledge the role of religion uh, in this debate. And I think that was a really important point. Thank you for bringing it to us um, around, you know, kind of pondering the, the white women who voted for Obama question and how Christian ideology really played a, a very dominant factor in this election. Christian privilege, yes, yeah. Christian privilege, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of offer that to the space as well. Um, what I will leave with is um, my hope is, you know, in, in reflecting on the Maryland Alliance, in reflecting on the, the outcome of the election, looking at how we can turn red states blue. And Eva Longoria wrote an article that said, we're going to turn Texas blue. And if you think, I know it's crazy, but... <laughs> It's actually not that crazy. If you think about the communities of color that are there, right? You think about the communities of color that are there, the, the work that's happening, the alliances that are being built. We have a, 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 a pansexual uh, uh, city councilwoman, I think in Dallas, uh, a Latina, mm -hmm. um, in Texas, mm -hmm. in Texas. So I, I don't think that's a crazy notion. And I think the, the work, again, I just want to reiterate, the work that you all are doing to elevate this issue, the, the work that we're doing cross, cross alliance, cross movement is so, so critical to build a progressive future. Thank you. I, I just want to thank this panel. Let's all thank them. Really appreciate it. And we want to thank you. So give yourselves a hand too. Go ahead. Open. And a big Open. shout out to ARC, because only the best conference that happens in this country every two years, only at ARC would this be a plenary discussion yes. with this group of people covering this much territory. So thank you, Applied Research Center. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> get up there. Yes. <laughs>